Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I have great pleasure in introducing the next keynote uh, because he is a colleague of mine. We're both professors in the Conway Institute and in the Medical School in University College Dublin. Um, and uh, I also have great pleasure in doing this because I've known Ken since he was a PhD student. We are both in Paul Sharp's lab in uh, Trinity College Dublin uh, between 1985 and 1990, uh, along with Dennis Shields, who's also in the lab. Uh, Ken was a PhD student, I was a postdoc, and this was Paul Sharp's first lab straight after he did his PhD. And uh, Ken did his PhD with Paul and also in collaboration with Wen Chung Lee in Houston, in Houston, Texas. And from his PhD, he got a couple of PNAS papers and a Nature paper, all first author, uh, where they were looking at rates of evolution uh, and uh, clocks in different organisms and different parts of, of different organisms. And after his PhD, he uh, went to Indiana to do a postdoc with Jeff Palmer, where he worked on plant evolution for a while, and then came back to Dublin, to Trinity College Dublin, where he was until a few years ago, before he moved out to University College Dublin, and where uh, he got involved in the yeast uh, genome sequencing project, I think initially as a way of making money. Okay, so uh, the, uh, uh, by getting involved in the yeast genome sequencing project, and by doing sequencing, he set up a wet lab to do this, uh, he then had spare sequencing capacity, which he could use for carrying out uh, molecular evolution work. So that's how he got interested in yeast, in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And uh, as an, in the aftermath of this, when the genome was finally sequenced, um, he discovered uh, what is known, got an acronym, WGD, which is the whole genome duplication with, with Dennis Shields. Uh, where the yeast genome that we now know has arisen uh, from a, 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 a duplication, an entire duplication uh, that happened um, in the early evolution of, of the yeasts. And uh, since then, uh, he is, be, been, is a very prominent uh, person, more in molecular ev evolution than in bioinformatics. He's an associate editor of uh, genome research and of molecular biology and evolution. He was president of the Society for uh, Molecular Biology and Evolution. And, uh, as happens, people of our age, uh, when you get a certain age, you start thinking about sex a lot. And so uh, he's, going to talk, I believe, he's going to talk about sex and fungi, I, th I, I think. I hope. <laughs> so thank you, Ken. OK, thank you very much for the, the, the um, introduction, Des. And thanks to Janet and Alex for, for the invitation to, to speak here. Um, Des reminded me that the reason I got into yeast genomics was that I was being paid to sequence the Saccharomyces genome back in the early 1990s. And for those of you PhD students who are doing high throughput genomics with Illumina HiSeqs or whatever, I will uh, boast that I was paid two euro per base pair. <laughs> so you would all be billionaires if you were getting paid at the same rate. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about um, is not genome duplication, it's, it's, it's sex in fungi. Um, I'm going to talk about um, a process called mating type switching or cell type switching in yeast species, which is uh, an example of a reversible DNA rearrangement process. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with, with, with Saccharomyces cerevisiae, I want to begin by just running through it, its life cycle. Uh, so it's the budding yeast, it's the one that you use to make um, bread and wine. Um, it can grow either as a haploid or as a diploid. So here's a haploid cell, it can um, go through mitosis. Over here on the right hand side we have a diploid cell also going through mitosis. Um, these cells are, are reproducing by, uh, when they reproduce mitotically they bud, so here's a mother cell producing a bud. That bud will eventually reach the same size as the mother and separate from it. If two haploid cells meet each other, so here's a haploid alpha cell meeting a haploid A cell, um, they start to, to schmoo towards each other. That is, the, the shape of the cell starts to distort. They, they start growing out of projection towards each other, and eventually, say this is an alpha cell here and an A cell here, these two cells will meet and fuse. Over here on the right, we see two cells that have fused. So there's the remains of one cell, there's the remains of the other cell, uh, their nuclei have fused, so the two haploids have now formed a diploid, and the diploid is beginning to bud. So over here uh, is the beginnings of a bud emerging from the, from the newly formed diploid. And that bud will have a normal shape and, and will, will go through this process of, of, of diploid budding. 
Um, if times get hard, in particular if uh, nitrogen runs out, the um, diploid cell can go through meiosis, so it can form spores. So we go from a diploid here with A and alpha, um, to making a, a structure called an ascus, which consists of four spores. Here's an ascus, it's got a thick wall, and each spore has got a thick wall around it. Those are basically survival structures. Um, they can survive desiccation, high temperatures, and so on. They can go through insect guts and get dispersed to new locations. Eventually, the four spores in the ascus may separate from each other, and one spore, once it encounters rich uh, nutrient conditions again, can germinate, reform an, a haploid, and so on. So that's the life cycle shown here involving mating. Now, if mating is not possible, so if we have a spore that germinates, it makes a haploid alpha, um, and that haploid alpha can't find a partner to mate with, um, then it can do something rather strange. Uh, it can make a mating partner for itself. What happens is the haploid cell here is showing alpha budding. It makes a bud that's also an alpha. And then the mother cell that just produced that bud will change its mating type. So here we've converted alpha, shown in red, to A, shown in green. Um, so we, we switch from one cell type to the other. Um, and now the mother and daughter can mate with each other to form a diploid. And Saccharomyces cerevisiae likes to grow as a diploid. So in the wild, most isolates of Saccharomyces cerevisiae are diploids, even though for scientists working in the lab usually prefer to work with haploid strains. Uh, haploid lab strains have simply been engineered to prevent them doing this switching process. But in the wild, uh, an isolated haploid cell can reform a diploid by this process of essentially mating with itself or a mother mating with a daughter. Gets you back into the diploid state, uh, allows you go, to go through my, meiosis again. Okay. Let's look in more detail at, at the mechanism of what Saccharomyces cerevisiae is actually doing when it's switching mating type. Um, many of you will be familiar with this process from undergraduate textbooks. It was discovered a very long time ago, um, in the mid-1970s, uh, by the lab of Ira Herskovitz at uh, Oregon and then at UCSF. Um, and it's so familiar to us that we perhaps don't realize how weird it actually is. It is a very strange mechanism. Um, Herskovitz called this a cassette model. Basically, what we have here is yeast chromosome 3. Um, in the middle of the chromosome somewhere, there is a locus called the mat locus, or the mating type locus, that determines whether you're going to be A or alpha. And the difference between A cells and alpha cells is that they actually have a different DNA sequence at this point on the chromosome. About 700 base pairs of DNA that is, is different. And, and they're not alleles, they're just completely unrelated DNA sequences. Um, what's shown here is, is the chromosome 3 of an alpha cell. So we've got the mat alpha here in the middle. Uh, Herskovitz called this the playback locus. And then there are two stores of unexpressed uh, A information over here on the right, alpha information on the left. These are called HMR and HML. And what happens during mating type switching is that the unexpressed information from HMR A here will get pasted into the mating type locus. So HMRA is out near the telomere in the right end of uh, yeast chromosome three. It's got chromatin modification so that it, it is not transcribed. It's simply a store of sequence. It's completely unexpressed unless it gets copied and pasted into the mating locus. And if that happens, the, the mat alpha locus here will now turn into a mat A. The A genes will be expressed at that locus. So it's a copy and paste mechanism. HMRA did not get uh, altered during the process. It just got copied. And then later on, a few cell cycles later, um, this, this cell may turn back into a mat alpha cell done by copying the information from uh, HML, which is the permanent unexpressed store of alpha mating type information. Um, so Herskovitz called this, this a cassette model. He had two cassettes that were stores of information. Neither of them could be expressed unless they were put into the playback locus, the mat locus. So this is a mechanism of DNA rearrangement. It's a programmed DNA re rearrangement. It was the first one, I think, that was ever discovered. Uh, we now know a few others. We know uh, VDJ recombination during um, antibody generation in, in, in human cells, um, chromatin diminu diminution in nematodes, um, VSG switching in trypanosomes. Here's a ciliate like paramecium. Uh, can uh, excise bits of DNA out of its genome as well. And phase variation in bacteria is another example. 
I want to emphasize the two over on the right here. Yeast is a unicellular organism. Bacteria are also unicellular organisms. Um, the difference between the unicellulars and the multicellulars shown over here uh, on the left, sorry, the, these three, um, is that in the multicellular organisms, these rearrangements are happening in somatic cells. The germline is not being changed, so the offspring inherit the complete genome of the organism. Obviously, if you remove a piece of your genome and you don't pass the removed piece of genome onto your offspring, then that piece of DNA has been lost forever. So for unicellular organisms, um, there's an information content problem of how you can do genomic rearrangement um, without losing bits of your genome permanently or irreparably. Um, and the way that it is done in both yeast and in uh, bacteria is to do it by rearrangements such as inversions or transpositions that do not actually remove anything out of the genome. Um, in the ciliate paramecium, again, it's a unicellular organism, but it's a slightly different trick, which is basically that it makes two nuclei, one of which acts as a germline permanent store nucleus and is not expressed, and there's a second nucleus, which is a somatic nucleus, which is expressed, but does not give rise to the offspring. Okay, let's look in more detail at what Saccharomyces is actually doing. Uh, here's uh, Saccharomyces chromosome 3. Uh, it's been twisted around, so the left telomere is over here, the right telomere is here. There are two repeat sequences that each occur in three copies on this chromosome. They're called Z and X. Each of them is just a few hundred base pairs long, but there are three copies of the Z sequence, three copies of the X sequence, and they flank the expressed mating type locus, the mat locus, and they flank the silent, unexpressed HML and HMR. So in this example, we've got a mat alpha mating type locus, and we're going to switch it to uh, uh, mat A. The first thing that happens is that the chromosome gets cut. There's an enzyme called HO that's an endonuclease, like a restriction enzyme. It's going to make a double-strand break in the chromosome. And this is going on in a haploid cell. So we've made a double-strand break in, in a chromosome, which is obviously going to be dangerous in a haploid cell if we don't repair it. That's the first step. So now we've broken the chromosome. Um, and now what's going to happen is the old mating information is going to be removed. And new mating information is going to be synthesized by copying the unexpressed HMR information. Uh, that goes into the mat locus. First of all, synthesis all the way across on one strand through about 700 base pairs of unique DNA here. It's called the Y region coming from uh, HMR. And then synthesize back again from right to left in this diagram uh, to make the second strand. That synthesis process is a highly error-prone process. A different DNA polymerase does that uh, replication um, than the polymerase that replicates the rest of the genome, and the error rate is about 1,400 times higher in terms of point mutations than the replication of the rest of the genome. So doing that switch is a dangerous thing to do, first of all, because you're cutting the chromosome, and secondly, there's a possibility you'll make point mutations when you remake it. Uh, but that's, that's what happens. Okay, um, a few years ago, we looked at species related, closely related to Saccharomyces cerevisiae to, to ask how do they do the same thing. Um, they all have this, this, this structure with triplicated regions. So, the, so I want to emphasize the function of the Z and X regions is that they provide guides to allow that, that copying information uh, process to happen. So invasion of DNA, after the double strand break gets made, it first of all invades here at the Z region, then copies through the Y region, which is different between A and alpha, and then it returns in the X region. So the function of Z and X are, are their guide regions. Now we found the same structure in um, about 15 species that we looked at closely related to Saccharomyces cerevisiae. They all had triplicated regions, Z and X. They all had an express mat locus and silent HML and HMR. Um, however, sometimes HMR was not on the same chromosome as HML and mat. But HML, HML and mat are always linked to each other they're between 100 and 300 kilobases apart from each other. Um, so it appears that this reaction needs to happen in cis for switching uh, that will involve replacement of DNA by HML as the donor of the silent alpha information. Um, and there's a good reason why this is a cis reaction, why it has to happen as an intra-chromosomal reaction. Um, it's because, first of all, HML is always alpha. So we never saw A information being stored here at the left arm. It's always alpha information. 
Um, and there's a, a site here that has been well characterized by Jim Haber and colleagues called the Recombination Enhancer. And what this does is it introduces a bias into mating type switching, such that if a cell, as shown here, starts as mating type A, it will switch using the alpha information as a donor. So it will repair a broken A locus with a copy of the silent alpha information. It wouldn't make any sense to try to repair a broken mat locus with a copy of the silent A information. You'd be switching from A to A. It would be futile and it's error prone, so you don't want to do it. So yeast introduces a bias such that A always switches to alpha and alpha always switches to A. And the way that bias is operated it, or is, uh, is, is implemented is by means of this recombination enhancer, which is actually a binding site for alpha proteins, such that if you are mat alpha, uh, you're expressing alpha proteins from the mat locus, they're binding to this recombination enhancer. The site is fairly close to the silent locus and it actually represses use of the alpha. So if alpha is already present at the, alpha, at, at the mating locus, the use of alpha to, to, as a donor for repair will be suppressed, and instead you will get HMR being used as a donor. Um, that repression probably has to, just mechanically or biophysically, uh, can only happen if HML, RE, the recombination enhancer, and the mat locus are all on the same uh, chromosome. Okay. Um, we also noticed when we compared these 15 species that a lot had been going on near the mat locus. So genes on the mating chromosome, not in the mat locus itself, but just to the right and just to the left of the mating locus, were different in different species. And by evolutionary comparisons, we, we realized that um, what, the reason these genes are different in different species is that there is a continuous process of DNA deletion rightwards and leftwards away from the mating locus. So basically, the mating locus, the distance between the mat locus and HML is getting shorter and shorter because genes like BUD5 here are being removed all the time. And we think that this is um, due to errors happening during attempted mating type switching that doesn't get fixed correctly, leading to loss of DNA beside the mat locus. Sometimes those genes will transpose to other locations in the genome. Sometimes they just vanish uh, if there's a redundant copy somewhere else in the genome. So, um, the, the flanking genes are being replaced, and in fact, the Z and X triplicated sequences are different in different species. Z and X are made of parts of the genes that flank the mat locus. So here, in this case, bud5 and Saccharomyces cerevisiae is the gene just to the right of the mat locus. The five prime end of that gene is present in the X repeat, uh, so the, the, the copy of X that's at, at, at HML, and the copy of X that's at HMR contain parts of that gene. So if we erode part of the chromosome here, um, we need actually to recreate new X sequence. We need to retriplicate that sequence in order to start up the system again. And this seems to have been happening over millions and millions of years um, during evolution of this, this structure. Okay, so I've explained how Saccharomyces switches mating type. Um, and I've explained that it's a dangerous process. It's error prone. It's deleting the genes flanking the mat locus. The point mutation rate is high. We're making a double strand break in the chromosome. They're all error prone processes. So in order to make all that process worthwhile, there must be a reason for mating type switching. And I haven't really given you a reason for mating type switching yet. I've just said it can happen if you can't find a mating partner. So let's look again at this. Um, if we start with a single spore, so remember spores come from these structures called acai with four spores in them, but the acai can break up, for example, if it goes through an insect. So there's a hypothesis called the lonely spore hypothesis, which is that if a spore is isolated out on its own, uh, it can germinate. It, here again, it, it's reproducing as an alpha that could switch to make an A and get back to being a diploid. Some people have said that the reason mating type switching exists is to get you back into the diploid state um, because the diploid state is advantageous. Maybe it grows faster, maybe DNA repair is better, and so on. Um, I don't really subscribe to that hypothesis because there, that is true in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but there are other species, for example, one called Cluvromyces lactis, that again can switch mating type, but preferentially grows in a haploid state. It will only mate if it's actually if it's starving. So K. lactis in the wild is found as a haploid. So, Getting back into the diploid state, I think, is not the reason why mating type switching um, exists. And instead, I think the, 
the reason why mating type switching exists is that if you can switch, you can make new spores again. So only by mating type switching here can you get from one spore back to more spores. Um, and the process is related, I think, or, the, or the, the selection is related to the process of germination. If you think about what germination is, you're taking a cell that has been dormant, maybe living in the soil or on a tree, maybe for, for a year, and one day it's got to decide, okay, conditions are getting good, I, can, I should start reproducing again, I should start replicating. Um, now, you want to, from an evolutionary point of view, you want to do that as early as possible so that you get a growth advantage over all your neighbors, but if you do it too early and conditions are actually not very good out there, you could make a disastrous mistake. You could germinate, uh, you can't reverse germination again, so you could be trying to grow in really, really uh, a hostile environment. So germination is an irreversible process. Uh, it's like European Monetary Union. It can't be reversed. Okay, so once you commit uh, to this state, you can't get out of it again. Uh, that's what the rules say. However, uh, if conditions are austere, um, you can switch. It's, it's, mating type switching may have evolved as a mechanism to break the rule that germination is, is irreversible. It lets you get back around here again and make more spores. And in fact, you can make more spores after just two replications. After two cell cycles, you can go from one spore back to four spores. So that would allow a germinating cell um, to, to, to try germination, and if conditions are bad, just to, to go back and make spores again. So what I'm saying is the point of mating type switching is that it introduces a reversibility into germination. It, it allows a lonely spore or an isolated spore to test its environment and to make new spores again, to resporulate if necessary. So it's a bit like a, a cold winter morning. Um, say it's a Saturday morning, you get up, you look out of the window, it's snowing, it's raining, it's foggy, whatever, and you just go back to bed and you say, I'll try again later, maybe conditions will improve. That's the point of mating type switching, I think. Okay, now this is a complicated system. Um, and I also want to emphasize, this slide is to remind me that it only happens in some species. There are other yeasts that do not switch mating types at all. So they are just, some cells are alpha, some cells are A. If they meet, they can mate, but if they don't meet, uh, the alphas are stuck as haploid, the A's are stuck as haploid. So where did the system come from? Um, how old is it? Um, and ju I just want to remind you that this, this is, there are an awful lot of components involved in this process. So in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, we have three mating-like loci. So we have the expressed mat locus and the silent HML and HMR. We have two guide sequences that are triplicated, that's the Z and X regions. Um, we have a system for silencing transcription from HMR and HML, that's uh, the SIR proteins, particularly SIR1, which is a, a, a yeast-specific uh, silencing protein um, there's the endonuclease HO that cuts the chromosome. Um, there's this donor bias system that I talked about with the recombination enhancer. And what I'll talk about in a moment, there's a cell lineage tracking mechanism involving a gene called ASH1. Um, and I want to point out that all of these things, uh, or virtually all of them, are, their only function is to make this mating type switching process happen. So that tells us from an evolutionary point of view, this is a an important process that evolution is maintaining and evolution has been adding uh, complexity to in order to, or to, to, uh, to keep the system going. So it clearly has, a, has a, a selective advantage. Okay, let's look at the cell lineage tracking business. Um, here's a life cycle of Saccharomyces cerevisiae uh, from a review by Jim Haber. Uh, we'll just start at the top here with this pink cell, which is a mat alpha haploid. Um, here's a mother cell the large pink circle budding off, making a bud. The bud starts to get bigger. Don't worry about the green thing at the moment. The bud starts to get bigger. Eventually the bud gets full size, the cells will, will separate, and then each of the cells will start to divide again. So here's a mother budding off, making its second bud, and the daughter, which was the first bud, now also making its first bud. Um, at that point, the switching process kicks in, and suddenly the mother cell and its second bud are now seen to have switched mating type. So switch cells appear in pairs. And the reason that they appear in pairs is that the switching process, the genome of this mad alpha cell, was actually switched um, way back here 
uh, before S phase that replicated the genome that gave rise to the genomes of itself and its second bud. Um, and that process happens only in mother cells. It's repressed in the daughter cells because this green thing here is the mRNA for a protein called ASH1. ASH1 is a repressor of the uh, endonuclease gene, HO, that's going to cut the chromosome. So that chromosome breakage doesn't happen in daughter cells. So this is, a, this is a, a, an mRNA localization process where the mRNA gets moved on, on, on actin cables up into the bud. So the, the ASH1 protein is not translated in mothers because the mRNA isn't there. That represses switching in the daughters and gives you this pattern. Um, so I refer to this as cell lineage tracking uh, because it tells, it's a way of telling the difference between mother cells and daughter cells. And what it means is that exactly half of the cells in a population will try to switch. So if you think of just a, a mass of yeast cells, half them will be mothers, half them will be daughters from, uh, from the previous mitotic generation. The ones that were mothers will try to switch, the ones that were daughters are inhibited for switching. So cell lineage tracking means that exactly half of the cells in the population try to switch. This donor bias that I talked about with the recombination enhancer means that they switch in the desired direction. Alpha cells will switch to A, alpha cells don't try to switch to alpha. So about 90% of the time, this donor bias works effectively and you get what's called productive switching. Um, so the result of those two things together is that if we imagine this lonely spore germinating and it, uh, it starts to reproduce mitotically, so you start to get a small colony with two cells, four cells, eight cells, and so on. Exactly half of them are going to be A's and half of them are going to be alphas. So if we get up to say eight haploids, that's four A's and four alphas, we can make four diploids. If we have four diploids and things get harsh, we can make uh, four, we can sporulate four times, we'll actually end up with 16 spores going on. So if the, from an evolutionary point of view, uh, if you can maintain the frequency of A's and alphas at exactly 50%, then you can get these germinating spores can make colonies that are completely diploid, and you will maximize the number of spores that you make uh, in the next generation. And we've shown by, by simulation that, that this can provide a reason for mating type switching to originate. So another way to put it is that switching allows every haploid cell in a very small colony uh, to have a mating partner and therefore you're maximizing the number of diploids, maximizing the number of spores, maximizing your survival if things get harsh, or if you made a mistake and you germinated at the wrong time. Okay, so I talked about um, some species closely related to Saccharomyces. So I said we looked at 15 species. Um, they were all in this top green clade here, the family Saccharomycetaceae. They all have three mating type loci, or three, three mating like loci. If we take a broader phylogenetic perspective here, the next clade we come out to is the Candida albicans clade, or the CTG clade. They only have one mating type locus, so they obviously can't switch because uh, they have no donors. Um, we got interested in a group of species called the methylotrophic yeasts. Uh, I'm going to talk about two species, Hansenula polymorpha and Pichia pastoris. In the genome sequences from those two species, there are two loci that look like mating loci. So it looks like there's an alpha locus and an A locus. So clearly, they might be able to switch mating types, but they can't use the same mechanism as Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, if we go further out in the tree, again, we get to species with one locus. We then get to the filamentous fungi like Neurospora, which are multicellular and can't switch mating types. Um, and then we go further out again, we get to Schizosaccharomyces pombi, which does switch, but I think by a completely independent mechanism to Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So I want to emphasize that the ancestor of all fungi is thought to have been multicellular. Um, so this yeast, yeast are unicellular yeast, unicellular fungi, um, and the origin of the yeast uh, growth form uh, on the Saccharomyces lineage is probably at this point here, the beginning of this clade, Saccharomycetina. So there was a switch from multicellularity to unicellularity, and mating type switching only makes sense if you're uh, unicellular. Okay, so here's one of these methylotrophic yeasts, Hansenula polymorpha. Um, as I said, it's got two mating-like loci in its genome. It grows as a haploid, um, and it's been des described as homothallic, which means that any strain can mate with any other strain. So there weren't, in the literature, distinct A and alpha strains. Um, 
two genomes have been sequenced. I'm going to call them NSYC495 and DL1. Um, these are actually two different species. So uh, Hans, industrialists often use the word Hansenula polymorpha. It's actually a rag bag of, of, of two or three different species. And these two genomes are about 10% different in nucleotide sequence. And they have actually been reclassified as Ogatea polymorpha and Ogatea parapolymorpha. But I'm going to call them Hansenula polymorpha. These genomes, uh, we just looked at the sequences that were done by other labs. They turn out to be completely collinear, even though they're different species. They each have seven chromosomes. And they're completely collinear except for one place in the genome. And the one place was the mating locus. So in strain NSYC495, we have, uh, or between NSYC495 and DL1, we have lots and lots of collinearity out here on the left side, lots at the right side. But in the center here, there's an inversion of 19 kilobases involving 11 genes. And alpha-like genes, there's two alpha genes and two A genes. The alpha-like genes are at one end in where one strain and at the other end of the other strain. And there's an inverted repeat shown here in blue. So that sequence there is identical to that sequence over there. So it's, it was fairly clear just looking at these genome sequences that recombination between the two inverted repeats had twisted around this 19 KB region. Um, we also thought by looking at the sequence that there was a centromere here just to the left of one of the inverted repeats. So that suggested a hypothesis to us, which was that uh, if there was heterochromatin in the region around the centromere, that heterochromatin might spread in this top genome here onto the alpha genes, which are just maybe at five kilobases or so away from the centromere. Uh, that would repress transcription of those guys, leaving the genes over here on the right, the MAT-A genes, to be active. Um, and then if the piece of DNA turned around, you would then get centromeric repression of the A genes, leaving the alpha genes to be expressed. So just by looking at the two published genome sequences, we guessed that that might have been what was happening. Um, we, we did PCRs to, to just first of all to validate um, that, that the genome structures were correct. So I'm going to show you several gels like this, so I just want to explain. Uh, so we, this is genomic PCR to figure out the orientation of the region. So here, again, the blue is the inverted repeat, the green is the A genes, the pink is the alpha genes, and with primer pairs, based in one orientation, an AB PCR with those two primers should give you a product. In the other orientation, A won't give you a product with B, but it'll give you a product with C. So we either get the, the outer two products on the gel or the inner two products on the gel, depending on the orientation of these pieces of DNA. Uh, it's a 19 KB region, and I'm going to refer to these as the alpha orientation and the A orientation. The alpha orientation is the one that we predict is going to express the alpha genes with the A genes being repressed by the centromere. Um, we showed that the um, gene expression does correlate with what we expected, so this is RT-PCR of the two A genes and the two alpha genes. Um, if you're, for genomes that are in the alpha orientation, the alpha genes are on. In the A orientation, the A genes are on, and in diploids, both of them are on. So gene expression correlates with orientation of this piece of the chromosome. Um, we verified that, that the thing just to the left of the inverted repeat really was a centromere. Um, we initially thought it might be a centromere based on GC content. So this is going along the whole chromosome. There's a trough or a dip of GC content over about a 15, 20 KB region. Um, there's no transcription in that region, so here we're zooming up. There's a transposable element. There's one complete transposable element and a bunch of long terminal repeats um, and apparently transcriptional silencing around it, which again said it could be a centromere. And we, had, we got some high C uh, interaction data from, from another lab. Um, the centromeres of different chromosomes are physically near each other in the nucleus, so high C can detect physical contacts between one chromosome and another in the region near the centromere. So this is just, again, going along chromosome three. Um, there is a peak of uh, contacts onto other chromosomes at a region that coincides with this predicted centromere. So all that said, this seems to be a centromere. And then we did chromatin immunoprecipitation, again, with haploids in the two orientations. So here the upper panel shows um, it's chromatin immunoprecipitation with a centromeric histone, CNH3 or CSE4, that uh, as you would expect, that histone is on the centromere itself, which is what the purple region here is, but it spreads a bit beyond the purple region into the, across the inverted repeat in blue and onto the next genes. In this case, in, the A genes are being silenced, apparently, by centromeric histone. 
And then in a haploid with the other orientation, where the magenta alpha genes are near the centromere, the centromeric histone has spread onto those, but it doesn't spread right across through the whole 19 kb region. So this makes it look as if it's the CENH3 itself that is silencing transcription uh, of, the, of one of the two mating genes, depending on the orientation of this region. Um, I told you that Hansenia polymorpha is um, a homothallic species, so you can cross any strain with any other strain. So we crossed two strains that had that chromosome in the same orientation. So these things here, here's the, the purple blob is the centromere, the blue is the inverted repeat, Here's the alpha gene away from the centromere in this strain, and again, the alpha gene away from the centromere in this parent. So these are two alpha strains being crossed with each other. You can see the gels here, they've both got the two outer products. And when you cross them and make a diploid, your diploid suddenly has a chromosome with this 19 KB in the other orientation. So we've, we took two identical genomes as parents. Uh, we had oxytrophic markers to select for formation of a diploid, and we suddenly find a chromosome orientation popping up in the diploid that um, that wasn't in either parent. Similarly, uh, we do the reciprocal experiment. We cross two MAT-A strains. If you just look at the gels, they're both in MAT-A orientation, but the diploid has produced an alpha chromosome from somewhere. So what we think is going on is that within a population of cells, a small percentage are switching, and then those guys are immediately mating with the majority of cells that are around them. So we see diploids containing the results of mating type switching. Um, we found that this switching is induced by um, nitrogen depletion. So here's an experiment where we, uh, if we grow the cells on YPD media, that's just normal rich media, nothing happens. So the top bar here is alpha haploids. Um, but if we starve them for nitrogen, which is NAKG media is nitrogen depletion medium, we suddenly see the appearance of the extra bands corresponding to some switch cells in the population. And the same with the A, uh, the switch bands start to appear if you deplete nitrogen. And then if you take that same medium and add in ammonium, you, you can suppress the switching. So nitrogen, uh, nitrogen starvation is inducing the switching. So what's going on, just to emphasize, is we have a chromosomal rearrangement that is inducible by an environmental condition. A piece of the genome, 19 kb long, is spinning around, something like this, okay? Except it's only going through 180 degrees, not 360. Okay, so what I've told you, Hansenia polymorphic can switch mating types. It's doing it by inverting 19 kilobases of its genome. It's a flip-flop model. It's just reversibly flipping backwards and forwards whenever it needs to switch mating type. The genes at one end are repressed by a centromere, and at the other end, they're not repressed, so they're on. And switching is induced by nitrogen depletion, which is the same conditions that induce mating. Um, because this is, is an inducible rearrangement, we don't see this happening if we grow the cells in rich media. It seems to be a regulated process, which would suggest that there is um, perhaps a recombinase, a site-specific recombinase. Um, so we're looking for that, and we still haven't found it. Um, the genome sequence has no obvious tyrosine or serine recombinases. It also doesn't have this HO endonuclease that, that Saccharomyces cerevisiae uses to, cut, to make the initial break. So we don't know how exactly the process happens. But we, went to, we did a screen to find genes that, that, that do control switching. And we looked for mutants that can't switch. And we found one immediately. Um, I started off talking about three strains, uh, NSYC 495, DL1, and CBS 4732. Um, this DL1 strain, it turns out, cannot switch. So it is stuck in the alpha orientation. So all the previous experiments I was talking about were done in this background, NSYC 495. And here you can see with this NAKG nitrogen starvation medium, you get the switch product appearing in the outer two lanes here. Um, very strongly after 45 hours of induction. But in strain DL1, we don't see any induction of a switched product. So DL1 is stuck in a particular orientation. Um, and it's been described as self-sterile. So if you get uh, two oxytrophic markers from a DL1 background, you can't cross them with each other. You won't get diploids. Um, my postdoc, Sarah Hansen, did manage to get DL1 to mate with the NSYC strain, NSYC 495. So um, she tried to map the defect, the switching defect in uh, strain DL1. So DL1 is stuck as an alpha. I'm going to call this switching minus. NSYC is a switching plus strain. She, they don't mate efficiently at all, but she managed to get a cell that was a heterozygous diploid between those two. So 
if there's a single switching locus, um, it should be a heterozygote for that. And then uh, she sporulated that diploid, so she gets basically four types of spore. They're either A's or alphas, and they can either switch or not switch, shown in, so blue for switchers, uh, orange for non-switchers. And it seemed to be a Mendelian locus, so there was one-to-one -one inheritance of the switching versus non-switching phenotype. Um, so she assayed each spore individually to work out, or a colony grown from each spore, to, to ask could it switch or could it not switch by doing this nitrogen indu induction, and she could genotype it as A or alpha. And then we did um, bulk segregant analysis, which simply means you take, you mix, you, uh, you, um, you isolate DNA from all the uh, individual spores, and then you mix those DNAs together and you sequence the DNA in bulk. So what should happen is when we pool all the switching DNA together, um, if the switching plus allele comes from the NSYC parent, then we should expect that at some point in the genome, the switchers will be enriched in DNA from that parent and depleted in, in DNA from the other parent. Whereas in most of the rest of the genome, we expect just a 50-50 inheritance of DNA from the two parents. Similarly, if we pool DNA from all the non-switchers, we expect to see the NSYC DNA being depleted in the non-switchers. And we can multiply these two signals by each other to, to, to try to map the switching defect locus. And we did that, this is what we got. So there are seven chromosomes. Uh, we got two peaks. Um, I know what the big peak is. I don't know what the little peak is. It doesn't seem to be related at all to, to, what's, uh, to any genes that I can identify. Um, but right here at the top of the, the strongest signal came from a gene called EFG1. Um, so what we found was that the DL1 genome has got a frame shift in this EFG1 gene. EFG1 is a transcription factor with a DNA binding domain called an abscess domain, APSES, uh, and the frame shift truncates the protein and removes the DNA binding domain. Now, EFG1, I'm, I'm gonna call it EFG1, uh, it's got different names in different species. So EFG is a Candida albicans name. Um, in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, because of the genome duplication, there are actually two transcription factors called PHD1 and SOC2 that are both orthologs to EFG1, um, and there are other orthologs in filamentous fungi. Um, these are regulators of filamentous growth in response to nitrogen starvation. So they're not directly related to mating in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So in cerevisiae, um, EFG1, was, or well, actually PHD1 and SOC2, as they were called, uh, were isolated as genes that contribute to, or that, that initiate diploid filamentous growth after nitrogen starvation. So um, Saccharomyces diploids, if they're starving for nitrogen and they can't sporulate because they don't have the right carbon source, they will instead grow filamentously. It's supposed to be a foraging response where they go looking for nutrients. They start to migrate and make filaments. Um, and EFG1 is a major regulator of that process. Um, so what's the connection to mating? Um, so over here, we've got the mating pathway in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Sterile 12 is the main transcription factor regulating uh, pheromone response and mating in Saccharomyces. Um, and there, there isn't a connection between EFG1 uh, and mating in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. However, this transcription factor, sterile 12, does appear both in the pheromone response pathway and is also a component of the filamentous growth pathway. And in a, another yeast species, Cluvaromyces lactis, there is a connection between these two things. So in K. lactis is a close relative of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but in K. lactis, uh, mating type switching, so just let me go back a slide for a sec. Um, so in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, mating type switching is done by the HO endonuclease, and it basically happens in every haploid cell. If it's, if it's a mother cell, it will switch. Um, in K. lactis, this direct connection is lost, and instead, the ploidy signal feeds into this gene RME1, which also integrates a nitrogen signal, which then makes the cells able to switch and mate. So K. lactis gives us a connection between the nitrogen starvation pathway and um, this gene RME1 into the mating pathway. So we tested all three of the genes I just talked about, EFG1, RME1, and Sterile 12. Um, we deleted each of those in Hansenula in the, the switching NSYC 495 background. And you can see, so these are two uh, NAKG media I mentioned before. Here's another nitrogen starvation medium. Um, you can see RME1 and sterile 12 completely abolish switching 
and EFG1, when you delete it from this background, vastly reduces it compared to the wild type. Um, so, uh, to summarize what's going on in Hansenia polymorpha, um, it looks like the, the nitrogen starvation pathway that I described in Saccharomyces cerevisiae is now an input into a state that I've called the competent to switch state. So in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, this, 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 switch doesn't, this competent state doesn't really, doesn't really do anything because you can pass straight, through. all it depends on is, is ploidy. In K. lactis, uh, it's integrated with nutrition through RME1. But then in Hansenula over here on the right, we have six, so RME1, EFG1, and sterile 12 are all required both for mating and for switching. So, for example, in a sterile 12 mutant, the thing won't switch. Even It doesn't matter whether there's a mating partner there or not. Um, it should switch just when you remove nitrogen, uh, but it won't switch. It needs sterile 12 in order to switch in, in response to nitrogen. So the switching is purely a physiological response to nitrogen depletion, but there's been some kind of rewiring of the, of the regulatory pathway between Hansenula and Saccharomyces. Now, finally, I just want to talk about a few other species. Um, I've, just, I've been talking about Hansenula polymorpha here. I'm going to represent it in this way on the left. Uh, so now the inverted repeat is shown in blue. Um, here I've bent the chromosome around, so you can, I've aligned the two copies of the inverted repeat with each other. And the switching in, in Hansenula involves taking this 19 kV region between the two and flipping it so that here uh, A was beside the centromere. If we flip it, we put alpha beside the centromere uh, and we change the, the, the cell type. In a second metallotrophic yeast, Pichia pastoris, we found something very similar is going on. Um, there's now a, a large loop, 123 kilobases, and there are two inverted repeats rather than one. So this extra purple inverted repeat has appeared. Um, and the silencing of transcription seems to be a telomeric effect rather than a centromeric effect. So Pichia pastoris is a telomere right beside one copy of the mating type information, uh, which we think is silencing that. And then 100 kb away, there's an active mating locus, and then there's the rest of the chromosome. So flipping, again, we showed in Pichia pastoris, I'm not going to show you the data, but we, recombination in this purple region is turning around 100 kilobases of a chromosome. The chromosome is about 2 million bases long altogether, um, and that causes this regulatory change that switches the mating type. Um, and by synteny analyses, we can show that the, the, these two repeat regions in Pichia correspond to the X and Z regions in, in an ancestor of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So the, I've used the same colors here to indicate orthology of these regions. Um, now I said the Z and X regions in cerevisiae were turning over all the time, um, but we can kind of infer what the ancestral regions were, or what the ancestors that, that, of those repeats were, and it corresponds to the, to the IR seen in Pichia pastoris, and then this blue IR is the one that's in Hansenula. So the mating loci are orthologous, the repeats are orthologous, but we've gone from a system with one repeat to a system with two repeats, and now to a system with two triplicated repeats. Um, so I just want to emphasize that in Hansenula and Pichia, shown here on the left, we're toggling between having one locus expressed and one silent. We're inverting uh, the chromosome. So not only are we moving the silent gene into the expression locus, we're also moving the gene out of the expression locus into the silent locus. We're just swapping the two. There's no new DNA synthesis going on. Whereas in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, over here on the right, there is a dedicated silent copy of the alpha information, a dedicated silent A, and each of them is uh, switching occurs by a, a copy and paste, as opposed to just a swapping system. So the, the key thing in Saccharomyces cerevisiae is that there's new DNA synthesis, copy and paste. And I think this has greatly increased the efficiency of mating type switching. So as I said, in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, you get 90% productive, productive switching. It, the switching happens in the direction that you want it to happen in. Um, Whereas in the other species, I don't think switching can be more than 50% productive because it occurs by recombination with a holiday junction. There's no way to bias the outcome, of the resolution of a holiday junction in favor of recombinants, in favor of crossovers versus non-crossovers. So um, switching to a three-locus system, as we have in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, from a two-locus system seems to have increased the efficiency of, of switching. Um, so I've talked about Hansenula and Pichia. 
Uh, we found similar flip-flop systems in two other species. We haven't characterized them in much detail yet. One is Pachysolon, where again, a methylotrophic yeast, where there's just an 8KB region of the genome, again, toggling backwards and forwards, catalyzed by inverted repeats. In this case, we don't know what is silencing the silent copy. Um, it's not a telomere, it's not a centromere. And down here at the bottom, Ascoidia rubescens has a 50 kb toggling piece here near a telomere, just like Pichia had. So it may be silenced by a telomeric effect, um, but also to the left of the inverted repeat, there doesn't seem to be, there are no genes and may well be a centromere. Then we get to a ribosomal DNA repeat. So it's not, we do know that both orientations of this thing exist in Ascoidia, but it's not quite clear whether it's telomeric repression or centromeric repression. And Ascoidia is interesting because of its phylogenetic position. So here's Ascoidia on the tree. It's got a two locus flip-flop system, but it's actually, it's not a methylotrophic yeast. It's an outgroup to all the other species I've talked about so far. So it appears based on this uh, inference that mating type switching in, this, in the Saccharomyces clade originated back here by a two locus flip-flop system that has been maintained in Ascoidia and it's and maintained in Hansenula, Pachysolum, and Pichia. And then on the Saccharomyces lineage, it got converted to a three locus system uh, with all these extra enhancements like, like, like donor bias and so on. And then in the Cantata albicans clade, this mechanism completely got lost. Um, so to summarize, I'm saying that the, the three locus, the three cassette system in Saccharomyces cerevisiae evolved from a two locus system in an ancestor. So you could imagine a simple two locus system toggling back, backwards and forwards. At some point, it, you go from having just one inverted repeat to having two separate inverted repeats. I think the reason for this may be that if the distance between the two matloci becomes very large, then in a diploid, the 100 KB or whatever it is between the two loci, uh, you can't get any recombination in there because if you've got recombination, you'd end up with dicentric or acentric centromeres. Um, sorry, uh, dicentric or acentric chromosomes. Um, so when, if, you, if, if the two loci move away from each other, one way you can straighten out the central part is to have a second repeat that, that, that straightens it back again. Um, and then all you then need to do is triplicate one of these units to now give you a three locus structure, uh, which is basically what Saccharomyces cerevisiae has. And then finally, cerevisiae has added in these extra things, donor bias and uh, lineage tracking. And just to emphasize, what I'm saying is that the entire selective process that has driven the maintenance of the system and the elaboration of this system is what I talked about, the ability of small colonies to make as many diploids as possible and therefore to resporulate if conditions are poor. So we go from a fairly inefficient system that's probably 50% efficient at the start. We've got to a 90% efficient system in Saccharomyces cerevisiae due to the addition of more and more components. So we end up with a very complicated machinery just to, maintain, just to create highly efficient switching uh, for small colonies started from single spores. Um, that's all I want to say. I just want to acknowledge the people. Um, so we're at, at UCD here in Dublin. Uh, the lab work was done by Sarah Hansen and by Ashleen Coughlin and the bioinformatics part of my lab is run by Kevin Byrne. And some of the data I showed you came from a US Joint Genome Initiative uh, consortium. So thank you. I can ask a stupid question. Um, these are all ascomycetes. So, do multicellular ascomycetes have sex? Uh, yes. So, or, or, organisms like, like Neurospora and, and Aspergillus um, have two mating types. Uh, they, they can only mate if opposite mating types meet each other, but they actually, they're multicellular and they have male and female uh, organs or tissues. So mating must happen between a male and a female and between an A and an alpha, but there's actually no correlation between the A-alpha genotype and the, the male-female uh, structures. And in fact, a single organism will have both male and female uh, tissues in it. Tom? So I don't know whether I missed when that was happening in time. You were asking the question when, but did you answer that? Um, I deliberately didn't put numbers of millions of years on things because it, it, in fungi there are very few fossils. It's very hard to date. Um, I could e estimate that the 
uh, I would guess somewhere maybe between 200 and 400 million years for the divergence between Hansenula and Saccharomyces. Um, the, so, the gene, yeah. uh, so the question is about the genome duplication. Um, the genome duplication is much more recent. Um, so if I go back here, uh, WGD here indicates the genome duplication on the Saccharomyces lineage. So the three locker system was in place long before the genome duplication happened. Um, the endonuclease that, that makes a double strand break is actually a specific only to this clade up here. So you can see additional components, the endonuclease and the um, silencing mechanism being added in specifically on Saccharomyces. So Hansenula can't use that endonuclease. It can't use this silencing mechanism. It doesn't have those genes. And in fact, both of those genes, I think, have come in to the Saccharomyces lineage by horizontal gene transfer. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your interesting talk. I was wondering about specifically this slide you have at the very bottom, the consent mm -hmm. mechanism for a completely different clade. Can you elaborate on that, maybe? Um, yeah, so I, I don't work with, with Pompey. Um, the, it, it, it's a very strange situation. So the, the Pombi switching system is analogous, but I'm pretty sure not orthologous to the Saccharomyces system. So Pombi has an express locus, two silent lo loci, but the way that it makes that initial double strand break to catalyze the switching is completely different. And even the lineage tracking aspect uh, is different. So in Saccharomyces, uh, I said switch cells appear in pairs um, two cells out of every four will switch to mating type. In Pombi, only one cell out of four will, will change mating type. So th the regulation is actually very different in Pombi, and the, all the molecular components are different. Um, I think it's, it's almost coincidence that Pombi has a three locus system and Cerevisi has a three locus system. Is that the last question? Yeah. This is a super basic question. So how come the mother cell doesn't force the child to change mating type instead, since there's a risk involved, involved in this? Uh, I, I, th I don't think it matters. Which, it, what matters is that one of them switches. Uh, and we got, for whatever reason, evolution came up with a system where the, uh, the mother switches and the child doesn't. Um, I, I don't really see any reason why it couldn't be the well, opposite well, way around. My reason is that, that when, you, when you replicate your own genome, there's, some, there's going to be a few mutation, right? Mm -hmm. And when you do this mating type, there's going to be some mutations. So why not have like the freak child with all the mutations and then have your own preserved genome? Uh, yeah, I mean, I know that that argument exists for, for proteins, that the junked proteins tend to get left in the mother cell and freshly synthesized proteins tend to be in the daughter. Um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, we, we, can't, we can't repeat the experiment. So, yeah. Okay. Um, again, I've got some housekeeping, but before that, uh, that's, uh, that's for Kent's view. That's